Our next guest is, um, I would say, a, a, a very controversial <laughs> investigative, investigative journalist, Yasha Levin. Uh, I learned to know you by reading an interview in the German magazine Konkret. Uh, maybe you remember that. Um, and I was uh, really challenged by your thoughts, also especially on, on the community uh, uh, we are in, in um, as uh, computer scientists, often uh, in this hacker community, because you, uh, you ga gave us uh, thump something to think there about all the technologies we, we like so much. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm really happy to learn to know you uh, now here in person. And uh, Yasha Levine will speak about uh, empire and power, the forgotten history of the internet as a weapon. This is uh, really a topic which our uh, fifth uh, forum of computer scientists uh, for social responsibility uh, um, is always talking about. This is our topic, that the inter but it's also a controversial uh, topic uh, if the internet and how much the internet is really related to military. So. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I'm pretty convinced that the internet is a weapon because uh, my own cloud, uh, iCloud, was weaponized against me. I thought it had s synced, you know. So I prepared a nice, a nice lecture notes uh, and decided to leave my computer at home and just took, take my iPad. And then when I got here, I realized that um, it didn't upload into the cloud, and so. It's now stuck in New York, and uh, so I was um, feverishly trying to type it back all out from my head, so I hope it, it'll be kind of coherent. Um, um, and I'll try to keep it somewhat short, because uh, I think I, I, I enjoy my, having a, a dialogue and a conversation with people rather than just sort of droning on and on and on about and losing people in, in, the, uh, uh, in the process. Um, so, you know, it, with, my talk is going to be about the weaponization of the internet, or the so-called weaponization of the internet, um, because um, to me, and uh, based on the historical uh, research and, and journalism that I've done, and uh, the book that I wrote uh, recently called Surveillance Valley, to me, the internet was always a weapon. Um, it was designed to be a weapon from the very beginning. Um, and we're kind of seeing the, the kind of logical conclusion of, of that beginning uh, t today. And so, you know, so, you know, people are suddenly terrified of the internet, uh, right? The way that we talk about the internet has really changed, I think, uh, in, the, in the kind of the popular culture. I'm not talking about just the professional, professional engineers or computer scientists or uh, but in the popular culture, people are talking about the internet in a completely different way than uh, they talked about it just just a few years ago. I mean, in, in, in essence, I think Donald Trump is to blame uh, for it all, because after Donald Trump was elected, suddenly um, this idea of the internet as being a progressive um, force, a, a force of democracy and egalitarianism, for whatever its flaws and, and limitations, that fundamentally that this technology represents something um, good and democratic that has begun to be to turned upside down. And I mean, I don't know what kind of, um, unfortunately, I, I can't read uh, German, so I don't know what kind of discussions are, are taking place in the press here about the internet and about you know, the weaponization of the internet. But in America, I mean, it's, it's almost absurd, the kind of stuff that you hear now. I mean, the internet is, to, is being blamed for just about everything. And, the internet now is being looked at as, you know, as, a, as a, what was nor a democratic technology that had been hijacked by these malicious forces and that have turned this, this, what was once a democratic technology, into a weapon uh, that essentially has no limits to, to its power. Um, you know, and, <laughs> and with this minimal investment in, in, this, in this technology, with, you know, just $50,000 on Facebook ads, you can essentially throw an election. That's how powerful it is, and that's how dangerous it is. And we get, you know, day after day, we have stories coming out in the press about, you know, frightening stuff that, that you know, you get the sense that the internet really is a kind of a battery ram against democracy now. And there is a consensus that's uh, emerged uh, about the need to 
control and, and limit it and restrict it in some way, to, to merge it with kind of the national security apparatus and to make sure that the Internet is subservient to the um, national security needs of the state. Um, and, I mean, this is very interesting because just a few years ago, Internet freedom and, and openness was considered a virtue, was considered the, the foundational reason in, for why this, the Internet was so successful and what um, explained its democratic potential. And so, you know, America would berate anybody who tried to enforce their own kind of national laws or cultural notions on, the inter on their own Internet space within their own borders. And it would see that as a, as a kind of a totalitarian uh, tendency. And so, you know, there's been an almost like a 180-degree turn with the way that people look at, at the Internet, the way that people see the Internet. You know, and, 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 and another thing about, about this, this change is that um, people uh, act as if it's something new, as, this, as if this weaponization, as if the use of the Internet by a foreign power or by a state to uh, influence people or to influence uh, politics or to influence culture, to meddle in some kind of way in, in the political process or just in, 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 in cultural process, is something new. That until Donald Trump was elected and, and installed as president, the Internet was uh, naive and neutral. Right? And, and these, form, these malicious forces came in and completely corrupted it and turned it into a weapon. Um, and of course, the Internet is a weapon, and it is, has been weaponized, but it's always been weaponized. Um, that's what it was designed to do. It was designed uh, by the Pentagon, by the American military, in the 1960s, um, to be a weapon, to be an information weapon, to be a, to be a management weapon. Um, a management weapon for, um, for, for the military, for a global military uh, presence, but also domestically as well. And so, and as I said earlier, you know, what we're seeing now is the sort of the logical conclusion of, of that initial um, push. Uh, uh, the internet is now per pervades, so pervades everything and uh, touches everything in our society, and so, its, its potential to be weaponized is much greater than, than it was, of course, in the 1960s when it was just a, a kind of a, a network that could transfer data and could uh, kind of an early cloud service, essentially, what it was back then. And so, um, so you know, this history... Hmm, let me see here. This is where my notes get, get messed up. <laughs> um, so, but... And the reason this idea of uh, the Internet as, as a weapon, the, 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 the reason it's controversial is because we've forgotten the history of the Internet and because its history has been obscured uh, and, and, and large parts of it just forgotten. And, um, and so in order to, um, to understand what the Internet is, uh, we kind of have to go back to history, because when it was created in the 1960s, um, the fact that it was a weapon, the fact that it was very obvious to people back then, this was something that was on the tips of people's minds, people talked about it, people protested it. And so I want to uh, focus on a specific uh, episode from that history. Uh, for, uh, this is probably my most favorite um, forgotten um, history of the Internet because it's, it encapsulates so much of what we're concerned about now, and yet it, it has been completely shunted from our, from our cultural memory. Um, so, uh, so, <clears throat> so to do that, I want to start with a story from 40 years ago. Um, it's, it t took place in September 1969 uh, when a protest broke out at Harvard University. Um, several hundred people marched through campus and occupied buildings and refused to leave. A similar protest broke out at MIT. The campuses were papered over with uh, flyers and posters that um, denounced what they called, quote, computerized people manipulation and warned that a new high-tech colonialism was being developed on campus that would enslave mankind. What were they protesting? They were protesting the ARPANET, which is the, the military uh, network that uh, would become the Internet a few decades later. 
from a historical perspective, these protests were incredible. Um, they, because they took place a month before the ARPANET actually went online. So the ARPANET went online, and the first node was uh, between UCLA and Stanford. And that happened in October 1969. These protests took place in September. So even before the network went live, there were students at these universities who knew what it was and looked at it as a weapon and, and talked about it as a weapon. They were not only protesting it, but they had formed a pretty sophisticated and, to us today, seems very uh, contemporary <laughs> uh, critique of, of this technology uh, and why it posed a danger to society. Um, so they saw the ARPANET quite simply as a weapon. Um, they saw it as an information weapon, a, a management weapon that uh, enhanced the power of the U.S. military and enhanced the power of, of big corporations to um, wield power um, domestically, but also around the world. Uh, and they saw this technology as a threat to progressive and left-wing movements. And, and so um, the reason they were able to have such a, a kind of a, 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 a precious understanding of the ARPANET <laughs> and of the Internet that they didn't even really know was going to, 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 to occur or to, to be born was that they were able to get their hands on a controversial uh, proposal uh, for, a project, for a project called the Cam Cambridge Project. Uh, it has no affiliation with the Cambridge Analytica. And uh, that, this, this proposal, this secret proposal, was uh, drafted uh, by J.C.R. Licklider, who was the, the now kind of famous founder of uh, the ARPANET. He, he was an ARPA manager who was invited to set up the ARPANET program, essentially. And uh, the, the project that he was proposing that would be part of the ARPANET program, that would be plugged into the ARPANET, uh, was, was a kind of um, an 8-bit version or an Atari version of what Palantir does today. Uh, so it would be run as a cloud service on the ARPANET, so anybody who had, who had an ARPANET terminal and access to that service would be able to log into it. And it provided, uh, for, for, at the time, were sophisticated uh, database and data management tools and software that were remotely based. And so an intelligence analyst or, uh, could upload whatever kind of data they had, and could, it could be structured in a database, and it could be then manipulated and analyzed in, in whatever way they wanted uh, to, to, to do it. Um, you could upload you know, do surveillance dossiers, financial transactions, opinion surveys, whatever. Right? And then you can use that to, to generate predictive models, uh, to map out social relationships, um, you know, to create just searchable databases that would be available to anybody with an ARPANET connection. Um, or, um, you know, to do the things that we now take for granted and we just are a part of what, you know, computers do. Um, you know, and, and this, this proposal had a specific emphasis because it was, of course, a, a military proposal and it was, uh, had a military aim. And its aim was to aid the counterinsurgency mission of the United States government that, um, that was dominating uh, uh, American military policy at the time. Um, and the idea behind the, the, this, this program was that it would allow um, kind of American military planners to, to, better, to, to, to get a better sense of what was going on in these places. So you could ingest, you could, you could ingest uh, data on, on, on on political movements, on uh, mix it with opinion uh, surveys and, and polls, and to try to maybe even predict uh, conflict or predict an outbreak of a revolution, and to essentially kind of uh, drill down into, into a population and to see what's going on and who's who. Um, and and to, to students at the, camp, the, this, the Cambridge project um, and the larger ARPANET system that it ran on, um, you know, they saw it as, as a weapon, uh, and they saw that this network that was being designed um, was a network of surveillance uh, and political control uh, and 
that it was part of a larger um, trend that was happening on uni university campuses across the United States at the time was that um, all sorts of weapons and military research was being conducted at these universities. And so they saw it as very much a part of that, and they were opposed to it. Uh, they didn't see computers at the time uh, as tools of liberation. In fact, very few people saw computers as, as, as technologies of freedom or democracy at the time. At the time, people saw computers as tools of power and tools that could allow powerful organizations, whether they're corporations or governments, to expand their power and to more effectively wield their power. Because those computers were huge, large, right? They, they were very expensive and they could only be purchased by these institutions. And, and so, for, for people back then, it was, it was very clear that computers and power were, were in, connected. And the ARPANET was very much just a part of that larger fear. And um, they saw the ARPANET as, as a tool that would facilitate the centralization of power. Um, the students at Harvard and MIT demanded that um, this project be shut down and that this research not take place. Uh, of course, uh, they didn't succeed. Um, and, um, but they turned out to be right. Um, they turned to, the, the Cambridge projects uh, went on for five years and developed a, a pretty robust um, uh, platform for, that allowed intelligence analysts to, to work with large data sets. And in fact, the CIA, uh, in, a, in, a, in a recently declassified memo, talked about how at the time, and this was now the early 70s, that at the time, the Cambridge project uh, and the ARPANET that gave access to it were the most sophisticated analysis tools that, that were available to a CIA, CIA analyst. Um, there was nothing better than that. So it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was a Palantir version of, uh, of, a version of Palantir of the 1970s. Um, but then it got kind of hairier because about six years after um, the protests, um, an, an NBC journalist uh, aired a series of reports on primetime television in uh, 1976, uh, exposing a, a surveillance program uh, that spied on millions of Americans and, and uh, took uh, files that were collected by the U.S. Army illegally collected on American anti-war protesters, on civil rights le uh, leaders, on anybody essentially connected to an, a left-wing or progressive organization in America. And they took these files, and instead of destroying them like they were on, ordered to by Congress, they used the ARPANET and the Cambridge projects to digitize them and to make them immortal and to make them easily accessible uh, to the NSA, to the CIA, to the White House. And this was a, a huge scandal. So it got three nights of, of coverage on NBC News. Uh, millions of people watched it at the time, and, um, and it, it went, the, these broadcasts went very deeply into the ARPANET, its, its architecture, uh, why it was, uh, why, why it was a, an, advance, uh, an advancement over previous um, database technologies. And the, the, the thing that really shocked people about the ARPANET was that it showed that you didn't really need these big centralized databases, these big, you know, big brother databases that had everything about you uh, in them, uh, because people were worried about, you know, the big, the one big government database that all your information is in. And there were a number of proposals to build those things, and they were all shut down because people were worried about them, uh, they, because it was just too obvious, right? What the ARPANET did was that it showed that you didn't need the one big database. You could have a bunch of little databases, and it, what, what mattered was connectivity between them and the ability to easily access them from any, from any other point in the network. And so there were two things that were happening with this, with this broadcast. One is that they confirmed the fears of, uh, of the protesters from se six years ago. Uh, they, they worried that the, this, these tools would be used to surveil progressive movements and, and left-wing activists. But they also showed that a, a kind of an evolution in terms of the way that of the architecture of surveillance, in that you didn't, you did, it didn't need to be centralized. The storage of the, of the information didn't need to be centralized. And that all you really needed was a system that allowed access uh, to smaller databases distributed wherever they were, as long as they were connected to the, to the, um, to the, uh, to the network. And so, you know, but, but really to um, understand, I think, 
Um, To understand why the internet was always a weapon, uh, it's, it's, I think, important to go back to the larger cultural and political environment in which it was built. Um, because back then, in the 1960s, you know, America was still a relatively new empire, uh, overseeing a, an inc increasingly chaotic world. It, had, uh, it, was fighting, um, it was fighting insurgencies all around the world, from Southeast Asia to Latin America. And it was also facing an increasingly hostile domestic situation. Uh, there was the anti-war movement, there was the civil rights uh, movement, there was militant black activism, there were groups like the Weather Underground that were uh, bombing federal buildings. It seemed like there was revolution happening uh, around the world and also a re revolution happening internally. And so in America, military planners and, and politicians saw this as two sides of one fight, right, that both of these things were connected, and they were both connected to the, to, the, to, the, to the Soviet Union, that the Soviet Union, while it was fighting this kind of Cold War with America, traditional military and, and, and nuclear forces, it was also fighting a new hybrid war against America by funding insurgencies all around the world and funding uh, protest movements and opposition movements in America. And so, in certain rarefied circles in, in, in the military at, at the time, it was seen, it was believed that in order to fight this new kind of war, you needed a new kind of weapon, uh, a, a new kind of management weapon that could allow uh, military planners, generals, politicians to see the world in real time, essentially, to have a, a, as much as possible. That was the dream. And so, and there was a, at, the, at the time, there was already a, a, a precedent, an example of, of this being done. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, America started building the first uh, computer-run uh, uh, early warning radar system called SAGE, yeah, which then later became uh, the NORAD. And this was a sprawling system with, with these giant IBM uh, computers sitting in these bunkers. Uh, and what, but what it showed was that you could create a, a, a surveillance network, a network that sits on top of the world and watches the world in real time, and you, could, and you can condense it down to a, to a dis, display screen, and that an analyst sitting at a screen can actually observe thousands of miles of, of border. And the, the, the idea was that to expand that, um, to, to, to expand that, not just to have that for, for, to observe the sky, but to have that for society in general. And J.C.R. Licklider, the man who set up the program that built the ARPANET, uh, worked on the SAGE program. And um, in particular, he built the graphical user interfaces for the displays, uh, the radar displays. And he was inspired by this. And he came to ARPA uh, with this inspiration on his mind. Uh, but he believed that in order to have this kind of new command and control system that could watch the world, you needed to start on a much more fundamental level. You needed to build the generic building blocks that, that would make up this system. So you wouldn't have to build a new system from scratch for every application, which is what, what, which is what happened back then. So you need to create a generic uh, computer and, and network system that could be universal, that you could use it to, um, to send emails and to, to share files, or you can use it to, uh, to run a, you know, a, 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 <laughs> to, 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 do, to do whatever you want. Excuse me. Hold on a second. Mm. Yeah, so, I mean, sorry, this is what I mean when I lost all my notes. Yeah, so Licklider believed that you know, the military needed to build a much more universal computer and networking platform that could be modified with minimal, uh, minimal effort to handle just about any task, whether it was missile tracking or uh, behavioral studies or just databases or voice communications or whatever. And so the computer, uh, this computer framework needed some components, you know, some basic components. It needed graphical, uh, intuitive graphical user interfaces. It needed uh, you know, a kind of somewhat universal operating systems that could share applications. Uh, 
Um, and it, of course, it needed uh, to be connected to other systems, and it needed a robust uh, networking um, component that could allow it to work. Um, and so, you know, that's what Licklider uh, aimed to do with the ARP when he joined ARPA. And, you know, he, he laid the groundwork for the ARPANET, and the ARPANET, of course, became the internet that we use today. And so, the internet and its infrastructure and the institutions that uh, surround it, you know, are all born out of this sense that we need to create a, a modern command and control system. And, um, and, and, and so, you know, it was driven by military needs back then, and it's still very much driven by military needs today, even, although it's gotten, become a lot more complex and there's a lot of you know, commercial uh, services built on top of it, but still the core of the, core of the internet is, is military. And I think I'll end there. We can take questions. Is it? Thank you very much. So uh, this was quite short, so we have a nice uh, time to discuss. Uh, and I already see a hand up. So maybe before you are there, I have a question too. Uh, for me, this is not really forgotten history. How, how come that you say it's forgotten history? Which part? Uh, that uh, the ARPANET comes from the military. Well, it's, it's not just the, the, the well, it's, of course, everyone knows that the, uh, that the, the, that the ARPANET came from the military. Obviously, it's the, you know, the Advanced, uh, Advanced Defense Projects Agency, um, the R&D wing of the Pentagon. Um, the forgotten history is, I guess, uh, the part about the fact that it was a surveillance uh, that was used for surveillance and, and weaponized from the very beginning. That's the whole point of it. Uh, and so, you know, there's a, there's a general, hist if you, there's general history of the Internet that, 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 that in which the Internet was made by the military and it, and it was born in the military, but that quickly went away somehow, right? And it became this kind of just academic an academic uh, project that, that, that even though it was born in the, in the military, it didn't really have military applications you know, past that for the very, very first very few years. And so when you actually look down, it, drill down in the, in the, into the internet, um, the, the military applications were there at every stage uh, and uh, they didn't go away. So I know that, of course, there's a, people know about that, that it came out of the, inter, uh, the, the, the Pentagon and came out of the military. But there's, I think, a, be a belief that it, it didn't stay that way for long, or it, it very quickly uh, veered away into a kind of civilian academic trajectory. Okay, so now the first question from the audience. Hello, my voice is not that good today. I hope you can understand me. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, all or many people of the, those who were involved with ARPANET are now famous in a way and interviewed many times. You mentioned the students who actually protested ARPANET even before it was launched. So I was wondering what happened to those students, what actually happened to those thoughts who uh, opposing the ARPANET and did you ever come in contact with students, find out what they're doing now or if, uh, how, how this discussion was continued maybe? No, it's a really good question. I, I, I tried extremely hard to track down uh, some of these uh, students. Um, there were not a lot of names uh, associated with the protesters because it was, it was covered in the press at the time. It was actually a, a big story um, locally and, and, and somewhat a little nationally. Uh, obviously, locally, there was written about in, in um, about, uh, about the MIT and, and Harvard uh, uh, protests, and there was a booklet that they even pu uh, published. So the, the the people who the group that was opposing the ARPANET was the Students for Democratic Society, which was this. Uh, you pr uh, many of you probably have heard of it. It's this really uh, influential and left-wing student organization that came out in the 1960s. And they, um, their Harvard chapter was able to get it, their hands on, on this proposal. And they created a little booklet that explained, you know, talked about the history of the ARPANET, the people behind it. And, uh, and there, were, there were names of the people who produced that booklet. I tried to track them down and was not able to do so. Uh, what, I, what I was able to do was to track down the, the journalist who reported that story and who reported, uh, who broke the story about the ARPANET and the Cambridge Projects being used to spy on Americans. And he, 
you know, this is the, his, his stories are in the congressional uh, record. They are, um, you know, they are in the archives, the NBC archives. He even wrote a book about it <laughs> called Techno Spies, about uh, the early uh, history of the ARPANET and how it was, it was used for surveillance and how it fit into the larger military context. And, and so, but those things were totally forgotten. Uh, almost as soon as those stories came out, they were eclipsed by a larger movement, a larger idea of, of the internet that kind of shunted away its military origins and its military aspect and clothed it in this counterculture um, narrative of, of communes and, and cybernetics and uh, the, the, the kind of the early w w wired style approach, wired magazine style approach to looking at this uh, technology. And so they, um, those things just got, just, they dropped down to the bottom of the ocean almost. And, and what surprised me is that as, so as soon as I went into the archives and began to look, you know, at, at, at look at this history, they floated to the top. They were, they were there for anyone to see. If you go to MIT and, and look through the archives of, of the Cambridge Project, you, get, you, you have clippings from these protests. So the people who are running this program, you know, they were obviously monitoring uh, these protests against them. And so they were clipping all, all, all the newspaper articles and, and saving them. And, and they even had a booklet, the, the, some of the materials, uh, protest materials that, was, that were published by that, that group were actually in the archives at MIT of the ARPANET archives. And so, and those, and those archives, you know, they were very well worn. People, there's a number of, uh, number of people have gone through them. There's a great book written about J.C. Ehrlichleiter called The Dream Machine um, that br briefly mentions this protest, but it was never given kind of a, 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 a strong weight uh, or um, an importance. And so that, that aspect, you know, just has been, has been forgotten and time has kind of just covered up with, with, with new things, but no, I, I did not, um, unfortunately, have not been able to track down those people. Hi, thanks Hello. for your talk that you came in here from New York yesterday. Um, yep, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me here. Yes. I'm sorry I'm a little bit, like, uh, not enough sleep and, uh, uh, yeah. A bit. Uh, most of us, I think, are computer scientists, and if we, if you talk about the core of the internet, or so we we may think about TCP, mm -hmm. IP protocols, yes. request for comments, where people are discussing how the internet should be working and shaped. Yes. So, and you said uh, that the internet was by design created as as a weapon to uh, to spy on. On, on what level did you find some evidence or did you read something about, is it about shaping TCP as an open standard where, where packets float through the internet unencrypted or is it, or was the idea to, to spread this uh, technology to all, to all the people that they are using it with their smartphones mm -hmm. later, <laughs> like 40, 50 years later? Yeah. Yeah. So on what level did you find uh, interviews or documents um, well, look, where, I mean, yeah. where we can find patterns in the technology itself. I mean, so yeah, so there's, so the, the first part of your question is, yeah, um, there, on, 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 on the standards level, uh, there's definitely um, involvement. Uh, um, some of the stuff is, is, is basically classified and, and we won't maybe know even for, for, for years about the NSA's role in and shaping um, the architecture of the internet. But for instance, one, one, th in one different way that they shaped it was that to, to kill a proposal to do end-to-end -end encryption uh, as part of the TCP IP um, standard protocol. And so there was, there was a, in, I think it was in like 1972 or, in, in, no, a little bit later. I don't exactly know exactly when that proposal was, um, was brought in, but the NSA came in and said, no, we don't want end-to-end -end encryption because there was a proposal to do that, to, to implement that, to make it a uh, uh, mandatory, right? Uh, and they, they killed that uh, because they didn't want encryption on the non-military or non-classified military portions of the internet. Um, they just didn't want it. And so they've, at a very early sh stage, they shaped that, th that standard. And so we're dealing with that now, actually, today, with the attempt to do end-to-end -end encryption on a, on a kind of a service level, right? And and so there are other uh, examples uh, 
of, of that nature. Um, but they're, again, like they, those, those are either coming out and bit, bit by bit in people's interviews, but they're not really well known. Um, I know that a, a, a really great um, historian of, of the internet is working on a book about, about that right now, and it hopefully should be out next year about how, uh, on, on a standards level, how um, involvement by the NSA specifically, because it was involved on a much greater level than people, um, than people realize um, in terms of, sh of shaping this. On, the, on, your, on your second part of your question, um, yeah, I mean, there wasn't a, I know what you mean, there wasn't a conspiracy in like 1969, you know, when they, when they launched that first node to create Facebook, right, and to create Android phones and to spy on us. I mean, obviously, the, the ARPANET, there was not even a guarantee that it was going to become a commercially successful uh, network. I mean, a lot of things had to happen for that, for that to occur. You know, the ARPANET um, was uh, overseen by ARPA, and then it was handed over to the uh, def D DISA, which is the, uh, the kind of the communications agency of the Pentagon in, in, in the 1970s. And then it was privatized and it was turned into the, the National Science Foundation uh, net, NSFnet, and that NSFnet was privatized and became the commercial internet that we, that we use today. And so there were a number of um, stages, right? But the, what's important is that, is that it, it all came out of the ARPANET and it came out of ARPA and it came out of this military um, it came out of this military project, and, and the um, involvement of the military didn't end when, when the internet became privatized. I mean, I don't know, like, I, one, one of just obvious examples to, to use in that, in that case, in this case, is sort of um, how military grants, research grants, that drive the development of technology. So I'm sure you probably all, you know, since, you're, since you are... Um, uh, computer science professionals and, uh, and, and maybe are studying at a university here, like, I don't know how it is in Germany, but in, in America, the computer, sci computer science um, departments are sustained in large part with, by, with, because of um, defense grants of, of various kinds, right? And they don't really, it's not a conspiracy, right? But, but they do drive the direction of, of, of research. Um, and like a good example, I guess, is um, I don't know, it's like, you know, Google being, being, coming out of a DARPA grant to create a digital library. And so, you know, Google wouldn't, probably wouldn't have existed in, 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 the, in, the, in the way that it has it exists now without, without that funding. And as soon as Google became commercially viable, it was, uh, began selling its services back to the, to the, to the national security state that, that, uh, that basically brought it into being. Um, and so, I think you know the the, the, the whole the whole the whole um, profession is a, is kind of sustained by a background national security influence and, and, and funding and direction. You know, I, I think what's what's also interesting about the ARPANET is not that it just cre it created the network, but it also created uh, modern computer science in America. So, computer science departments are largely the byproduct of the ARPANET program. Um, and s because they, computer science didn't even exist as a, as, a, as a separate profession, it was electrical engineering or whatever, but, but, computer, but ARPAN, ARPANET sustained funding over many years created these permanent computer science departments. And they're very much, so that network that ARPA created was actually more than just the, 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 the communication network, but actually created a, a network of, of you know, personalities, but also institutions, and, 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 and set up the funding for those institutions and set up kind of patterns for those institutions. So, so, so you know, the, there's, the involvement of the military happens at, at every level. And of course, you know, you have something like, as, as maybe I'm best known around here for, is the TOR project, something as, as obvious as that. I mean, the TOR project is supposed to be an anti-government entity, supposed to protect you from government surveillance, yet it, it's almost entirely sustained through government funding. And contracts, contracts from the Pentagon, contracts from the State Department. Not just, here, ha have some money, do whatever you want with it, but actual contracts with deliverables and things like that. So, so how is it possible that even the parts of this network that are supposed to be against 
you know, the military, against the Pentagon or against the national security state in America? How are they also sustained with funding from that very same entity? And so you can, you, if, you, if you take a sample, you know, a core sample at any level, you'll get essentially to some kind of defense core in a lot of these things. Um, yeah, I also want to say thank you for this presentation. Um, actually, I'm not a computer scientist, so for me, um, yeah, you nailed it because um, I didn't know this history exactly, just I knew that there was something like the ARPANET or something. But what's really interesting for me and following up on your question, the first question is how, and it's one of your working hypotheses, how did it get obscured? Because um, this was the original story, and now we are in a time that Amazon, for example, is getting big government contracts to make like cloud systems for the Pentagon, for the NSA, um, for military, like huge military contracts for all the wars that have been led in the recent years. So how has it been obscured? Because we actually, I don't think we as a society are fully aware of this aspect because mostly when I look at my, when I discuss with peers and what I experience in, in everyday life is that people have still have the impression it's mainly a civic thing and the, the, uh, the military is also doing something like in the internet and people don't know maybe but so yeah this is what I, maybe you can elaborate on this a little bit, how did it get obscured, what, what did you find out about this aspect? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it got obscured because of, of culture and money, <laughs> I think, and business. Uh, when, the, uh, when computers began going mainstream and, and it began to, it, when com computers began to be a big business uh, in, in basically the 80s and, and the 90s, a, a new kind of cultural sort of stream kicked in that really began to redefine them away from their from their, corp from their military roots and as something that was radical and counterculture and, uh, and actually revolutionary. And so, you know, the way that, w one thing that I really got a sense of while writing this book was the way that memory, cultural memory, is, is impacted by power and, and, and business and business interests. And that, like, when in, in the 50s and 60s and, and even 70s, when people's notion of what a computer was or what a computer network was, I mean, it was, it was intimately seen as a thing that, pow that is wielded by power. It is, is an instrument of the powerful, an instrument of the powerful to expand their power even more. Um, and people were afraid of them. They saw them as, as a threat. And in the 80s, uh, and, and, and then specifically in the 90s, that really just went like the other way. And, I, and, and you can just see the way that, the way that um, uh, kind of narratives can shift. Um, and, and I think that's largely a, a consequence of, of the fact that you know, ideas, there is a kind of a marketplace of ideas or almost a free marketplace of ideas where certain ideas that um, are useful to power or useful to business interests or useful to empire are funded very profusely and ideas that go against that aren't funded at all or aren't given really a space and eventually you know there's a, the old notions get kind of buried and, uh, and, and, and forgotten and so it really is a business revolution in a way, is what, is, what, is what switched it. So it wasn't even a government conspiracy, I don't think, you know, to, to convince us that this military network is actually, uh, you know, a, a tool of liberty and a tool that will equalize power between us and, and, and giant corporations and, giant gov and, and, and governments. It was really a, 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 the business needs of uh, the computer industry and then of the internet industry to... to uh, rebrand the, these things away from their military origins. I mean, you know, the classic you know, Apple ad uh, from 1989, right, where, they, he, where Apple is seen as the, as, as the thing that smashes Big Brother. I mean, it's just a classic example of that, uh, directed by Ridley Scott. <laughs> so, just, a, just an idea of that, like that, but, but if you actually 
and multiply that by a million fold in all sorts of different ways. You get a, you get, you get a rewriting of history and, and a rewriting of our conceptual understanding with, of what uh, computers are. I mean, look, I, I'm also kind of a, a, a layman. I, I have a slightly better understanding of computers than, than most people just because I, I did half of a computer science degree and then at, at UC Berkeley and then I, and then I dropped out. Uh, of, of, of the degree because I realized that I didn't want to sit in front of a computer all, all my life. But then I became a journalist, and so I sat in front of a computer all my life, so it didn't really... Do, and then wrote about computers, so... Um, so <laughs> but, you know, but, but so I, I have a better sense of it, I guess, so I'm not afraid of this technology, just because a lot of people who don't understand how this stuff works, it's like a black box, it's magic, right? Um, it's, 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 it's hard to... Um, it's much easier to kind of to be to, to, to be swayed by this you know, to by, by these ideas. But at the same time, I think you know the computer industry and, and, and computer scientists and people who work in this field are also very susceptible to this to this kind of rebranding. And the fact that we're even having, having this conversation is, I think, a testament of that. Um, you know, um, but yeah. So I think it's really about business interests. And, and Smoking was good for you, too, at some point, I remember. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh. Um, I have the microphone, so. <laughs> um, I have another question, which is, um, you've talked about the Internet being funded in large part by the military and uh, having a military history. So my question is, um, what's your idea on how can or can it be used to actually help bring about more peace in the world? <laughs> I'm not sure the internet is going to uh, bring about more peace in the world. Um, maybe if everyone just sort of gets strapped into a VR console and just sits there on their couch, being fed intravenously, you know, maybe there'll be peace. But, um, I mean, uh, you know, it's... Uh, definitely, the, I, don't, I don't see the internet as being an instrument of, of peace. Uh, the internet is just a, a telecommunication system uh, that um, reflects the kind of the norms uh, of the society that it was invented in and in which it's used. And so the internet is uh, dominated by the military and dominated by spies and, and owned by these giant uh, corporations because uh, our society is owned and dominated by these very same forces. And so I think you know, one, once you change this, if you, the internet will change along with society. I don't know if the internet will be a driver of change in society. You know, it's just, a, it's just an, exp it's an expression of it. But I, I have no idea how to, how to bring about world peace. Just, if, I, if I did, I'd probably be at a TED talk right now and not here. Just, just saying. <laughs> Okay, uh, I would say just two more questions. Please, okay. short answers, because now uh, it's only three Sorry, minutes yep. left. So I'll, try, I'll try to keep it short. Okay. All right. First, I just wanted to say thank you very much for uh, coming to this forum. It was quite the pleasure to have you here and, and to be listening to the aspects of the, the history of um, architecture, in particular, the history of the, arch the internet architecture that we have today, which is largely informed by the ARPANET. Um, but I was hoping this could also lead to a discussion, like maybe even tied to the previous question of what is to be done now that we kind of know maybe that the, the internet we have currently is very tied to a, a military history, uh, perhaps by looking at other attempts that occurred during those same 60s and 70s times that maybe weren't as tied to military <coughs> histories. Would you say that there were any other um, network architect networks that were attempted to be built during the 60s and 70s that could maybe provide a, an alternative kind of view? The only one I'm aware of that may have also been in the MIT archives was the work of Eden Medina, who was working on uh, cybernetics of what was going on in Chile. I don't know if you want to comment on anything similar. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, there was, well, you know, there's a kind of the socialist, it's interesting because there's networks that, that were built in the Soviet Union or there was an attempted kind of Soviet in, internet to be, to be built, although it's, you couldn't really call it the same way, but it's interesting that in in these kind of socialist countries or the socialist movements, they, they, what, you, what you see there is the, an attempt to build these networks uh, that could help manage the economy or manage production and, ma and things like that. Whereas, you know, in, in America, the internet was about managing the military. Um, and, and so, 
what, what's kind of interesting to me uh, doing this comparative um, surveillance studies or comparative internet studies is that it was, it, was, it was America that created this kind of global surveillance system, and it wasn't like the Soviet Union that did that. In fact, there was not even any proposals for that. The proposals for Soviet networks were about, really about managing society. I mean, there were top secret net networks that managed the specific things like military uh, installations and, 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 and missile installations and things like that. But as a kind of a civilian, on a civilian level, they were all about managing the economy. Uh, and not really managing uh, people or watching people. Um, you know, I, I guess, yeah, there was, other, and there was, civilian, there was a civilian uh, network in France. You know, there's some other kind of alternatives that got, got essentially uh, rolled uh, by, by, by the expansion of the, of the Internet and of ARPANET. Um, it, it's... I think, you know, in terms of in, in America, there was a moment, I think, where there was, there, it, it kind of could have gotten, gone another way, and that was the moment when it was privatized. So the, the network was handed over to the civilian agency, the National Science Foundation, and then, which then prepped it for privatization. And the way that that privatization was designed was, I think, instrumental in, in, in kind of um, determining how the Internet became what it is today, because it was... It was offloaded to these telecommunications companies uh, that have historically had very close ties to the national security state. And, and it was privatized to them. It wasn't given over to, let's say, I don't know, the Postal Service and, and run in this kind of more of a um, democratic way. Uh, 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 but it was just handed over to, to giant corporations. Uh, and so there was a moment when the Internet in America, at least, could have been a bit more democratic but it didn't go that way because it was privatized at the, at, the, at the height of the Reagan era. And it was just, you know, it was ideologically that's the way it w went. So it was national security and, and, and privatization and, 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 corporate, and corporate profit. So these are the two things that kind of drove it from that, from, from that, from that point, and they keep driving it today, I think. Yes. I think I would like to add another comment. Uh, I guess if I would frame it as a question, then that would take a bit more time to answer. What I would like to, or, or what came to my mind after your presentation is that um, you've mostly talked about the internet as a weapon, as surveillance uh, for the people. But um, when I think about what, for example, Facebook is planning by trying to um, connecting um, areas of the world who do not have internet access yet, uh, for, example, by, for example, by weather balloons, in this case, the internet uh, could be used as a, a tool of colonialism or a weapon of colonialism. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the, the protesters of that, that at MIT and, and Harvard would agree with you. I mean, in fact, they saw this network as a tool of colonialism uh, because uh, they, were, they were against you know, an American imperial power this, and, and a colonial power, essentially. Well, they didn't call it that, but... But then they saw that this network, if, if allowed to expand globally and, and to do its thing, to do what it, what it said it would wanted to do, it would be a tool of colonialism and a tool of colonial power that would, could be, be used to watch and control um, those, those, you know, other people around the world. But, of course, um, it was also done domestically. And so I think, again, that's why I think that episode is so, is so interesting because it's, you can draw a straight line from, from their concerns and... and, and, and and their view of the ARPANET and their view of, of that project that they were protesting against to the internet that, it exi that, that exists today. Uh, Google, Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, all these things that we're suddenly concerned about, they kind of had a, had a seed of that almost 50 years ago. And so, yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Thank Yasha, you. Levine.